how do you transform a damp and dirty basement in an old British house from this to this? It's now a multi-purpose family living space with an ensuite bathroom and the option to use it as a guest bedroom. Not to mention the second room, which houses integrated appliances hidden behind doors, lots of storage, a kitchenette, and a fold-out desk. Let's go back to the start of the process. When you're embarking on a project like this, it certainly helps to have a client who is creative, ambitious, and has a realistic budget. Joanne and I met on the Interior Design Masters TV show where I sometimes work as a set builder in the background. She was one of the designers on series four and shortly afterwards she asked me to help her realize her vision for this space. When I first came to take a look at the space, the guys from RYJ Damp were already well on with tanking the basement. They'd put down the subfloor, they'd installed a pump to extract excess water and they were now over cladding the lined walls with stud work and insulation. The first site visit for a project like this is all about listening to the customer first of all and understanding their vision, making sure that they've explained everything in their heads. But I will then use that first visit to take very detailed measurements. And in this case, I was offsetting for the plasterboard that I knew would be added on and drawing a 3D model for what I knew would be the final dimensions. I then went straight to trying to interpret her fairly clear vision for this snug room where she wanted a flat wall that would hide with built-in storage would hide these unusual structures in that room, including accommodating a fridge, specific storage boxes for Christmas decorations, etc. And this idea of some sort of vertical slatted emphasis, this was the first attempt. Then we started looking at material samples, including the EasyTex Negro pressed MDF boards from Fincer. And as soon as Joanne saw the one called Mojave, which has a ripple-like texture, the decision was made. She said that's the one for the doors. We decided to pair that with the Roble as a Bache or dark oak melamine effect board from the Fincer 1220 range for a dark look throughout that room. And then in the contrasting utility room where she'd already picked some pink toned tiles that were a bit of a nod to the, the old tiles that used to be there, she saw from the Durat solid surface sample pack a pink shade that she loved that, that complemented the tiles quite well. Durat is a solid surface made with partially reclaimed material bound up in resin. And alongside that she wanted white painted doors so we used our usual Sailac AT99 water based paint for those upper doors. For the tall lower doors she had originally pictured birch plywood but we ended up going for a new maple faced plywood board. Here's a quick comparison video from my Freebird Trade Instagram account around that time. So that's that's the birch plywood. You see that it's a bit pitty. I mean, it's a natural natural material. That's not necessarily any great downside. But just for comparison, that's this new ma maple board. Looking at the edge, so birch ply on top. You could ignore that hole that was for hanging it in the spray booth. However, both materials are very prone to warping when used as tall doors. I've always had that happen with birch ply. I sort of hoped that maybe somehow miraculously this board would be better, but it wasn't. It was prone to warping. I'd warned Joanne and Tim about the likelihood of this ahead of time, and we'd priced a contingency option of, of retrofitting door straighteners. In the end, they decided they were happy with these strong magnets from Amazon. Okay, let's have a look at the workshop processes. I haven't done a big build video for some time and you'll see some changes in the workshop, not least the CNC and, well, a lot really. See, see what's changed since you last took a look at my videos. We're cutting out these 19 millimeter thick through dyed MDF boards with an eight millimeter diameter compression cutter. After cutting the 2.8 meter long boards roughly to size on the panel saw. Our CNC machine is an eight foot by four foot bed with eight tool changer. We've invested a lot in learning about tooling, both cheap and expensive, and also in the, the software. Uh, a little bit more on that later, but if you're looking for advice on CNC, you need to get the software right, as well as the hardware choice, and do ask me for advice on that. There's content on the membership site and more to come in future as well. 
Now, when using a compression cutter, it can leave this compressed slug of dust in the gap. This is after we've removed the sort of out of waste frame. Here with the boards moved closer together, you can see how the final three millimeter door gap still leaves the pattern running through. Now here you'll see me using the Lamello Zeta P2 handheld machine. Uh, without the fence flopped down, just using the 10mm reference off the base there to cut the P-System slots. This was for the bed panel, which had the effect of wrapping around that textured wall across the front of the bed, concealing the bed, and it can be accessed just with a hop-up stool. So the P-System fixings, both Clamex and Tenso, were used in lining up those panels because they went beyond the width of the board. Here you can see we're putting the Clamex fitting in. This is the one with the metal cam that will turn with a little hex driver through a, a hole that can be drilled out of sight. Now while the Zeta P2 system fixings get plenty of use where appropriate, sometimes you just can't beat a pocket hole fixing for speed and ease because you're just drilling one piece and then self tapping the screw into the other so that's what we used for these cross ribs to make up the, the bulk of the wall there and we used the standard 18 millimeter thick Robley Azabache melamine and you'll see some capping pieces later which were simply glued together at 36 millimeter thick uh, then cut out on the CNC machine and then edge banded with a, an extra wide edge. In fact, you'll see Matt's just simply using super glue there to then put the other layer on to make that up to the 36. These are the Tenso fittings. Earlier, I was using Clamex to make a strong, rigid join between panels that I intended to stay permanently fixed. The Tensos I'm using here is a quick and easy way to join the two sections of wall on site. So this was just a test fit. Now you can see the CNC machine doing its thing for the carcasses. So that's all planned in cabinet sense. You'll find lots of videos on my channel and more upon request on the membership site showing how we set up our carcasses parametrically through cabinet sense in SketchUp and then control the CNC machine uh, via Vectric. Now for these cabinets we specified the 60mm tall Hayfully Axolo feet because we wanted the impression of a continuous wall in which doors were effectively hidden. The benefit of these Axolo feet, especially at the shorter height, is that you have this adjusting tool which can be used to reach further and where your arm wouldn't fit and it will raise and lower the feet. These short feet caused us a problem though because with the units also being so deep it turned out that the dimension of the unit on the angle as we were trying to raise it was taller than the ceiling so it was fouling on the ceiling. We managed to get around this with a combination of trimming with a power plane on the corners and for one unit we did have to assemble it in place which was tricky because we hadn't built them to be assembled in place. You'll also see that we used the space plugs for securing and spacing off the cabinets to the wall. They're between the wall and an MDF strip that was set back to receive the scribe. We went for the matching Robley Azabache material on the scribes. Um, here over the bulkhead we were putting a, a matching panel to hide that. And then here between the units where the bed panel was going to meet, again there was a slim panel uh, just popped on as you can see with tensos um, onto those MDF backer strips. On the left hand side of that panel we simply used screws because they could be hidden under the hinge mounting plate so there was really no need to go to the trouble of cutting the P-system joints. Okay, so we've got this all jointed up. These are just layered up strips screwed on. There'll be a topper on top of that to hide the cut end. And now we're over at this side, we've got a packer and some super glued on 
additional scribes just to pack it to that wall gap. So that's just dropped in nice and snug. And I'll get that screwed on. I'm also fitting the touch latches. These are Blum branded touch latches called tip on mechanisms. So you just go into that holder, which has gone on already with uh, concealed screws, and the door will just activate to uh, release it. So you just touch it, and the action of just pushing in a couple of millimetres is enough to throw the door forward. Meanwhile, back at the workshop, here's Brady spraying up some of the Mojave doors with our usual Sailac water-based lacquer, AF72. We did try using some Rubio Monocoat on a sample of this board, but we didn't get this lovely black sheen in the same way that we, we felt looked good in the workshop. Um, in reality, as you'll see later, there were some concerns around variation in the blackness of the board. And if I did this again, frankly, I would just paint them black to control that, unless it was an isolated panel where we weren't going to get edge-to-edge -edge colour differences. In the end for the bed panels there was a bit of rejigging and we ended up sort of swapping parts around, moving them over, redoing the Lamello Zeta joints until the blackness met without this stark join that you can see on this image here. So we pretty much swapped that panel around to the other side. Here you can just see the jointing of those 36mm edge banded top pieces. In keeping with the dark look of this room, we went for the black onyx hardware from Blum. Back in the workshop, we had prepared the doors with drilled holes numbered 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on from left to right which also indicated the bottoms of the doors to ensure that we knew where to put each door as we unwrapped it to ensure the, the lineup of the pattern as it had been planned. To cover that central bulkheads panel we couldn't fit hinges to the doors in front of it at the top there so instead we CNC cut a groove ready to receive a door straightener just in case those doors flopped a little bit out of straight. In fact they've been perfectly fine and stayed rigid so we never did fit the straightener. We considered fitting a Blum compact hinge, but it would have moved in such a way that the door would have, would have fouled against the adjacent door. We did use that hinge on the meter cupboard, which you can see here, which had to be as low profile as possible for coming down the stairs into the space. Look out for a future video focusing on that com compact hinge and its characteristics. Back at the workshop, Matt and Brady were processing the white melamine carcass parts through the CNC, inserting the Cabaneo fixings on the bed of the CNC, and then reading off from the plan that comes out of Cabinet Sense, which indicates which edge requires edging, putting it straight through the edge bander, and then onto the cart, which will go straight down that runway to the rear shutter, ready to be loaded into the installer's van. Our system is designed to minimize double handling, so the edge bander is near to the end of the CNC, so you pick a part up once and run it straight through. You can put the Cabaneos in first, which again we have found to be more efficient, and they will run through the edge bander. Sometimes if the Cabaneos are proud, they may make the edge band trimmer trim slightly less, but that's really only on a very few parts where the, the Cabaneos need to be near to the edge. We'll then manually trim that, or in many cases, it's out of sight anyway. The last thing to install in the snug room before we moved on to the utility where Neil would be helping me was the wide sliding door in the black Mojave board across the ensuite. I decided to do a test fit in raw NDF before committing to cut this, this very expensive Mojave board to check that the size worked, that it didn't foul at the top, and, top or bottom because the tolerance was quite tight actually to the ceiling to check that the runner, runner hardware worked correctly. Now these are runners that I got from Amazon and I would recommend them, they were quite robust. Once I was committed to the sizing, including knowing that the sight lines kept the privacy into that ensuite opening, we, we sprayed up and fitted the door as you can see here with the addition of two door straighteners on the back. So that's the first room finished, along with the tiling by GM Tiling from Leeds and the gold leafing on the ceiling by Daniel Bland, 
we were ready to move on to the utility room. There was a lot of furniture to fit into this room and a lot of it needed careful thought to integrate appliances. There was a microwave to be kept next to the sink there, electrics to be mounted in the drywall style back boxes and also plumbing to be routed through in this large cabinet to go in the corner. That's because we were going to have the washer and dryer one on top of the other in this cabinet and so for that reason we also strengthened the shelves with extra battens to bear extra weight and we sealed the corners where shelves and bottoms met sides and backs with sumo grip which is my preferred general purpose adhesive sealant. The next cabinet to assemble and fit was this unusual shaped one that needed to tuck into the alcove but then project out a little bit deeper beyond the alcove so we had to fit this hinge mounting strip which would also receive the wall scribe and notch the shelves. So that was all done in cabinet sense and sketch up and then sent to the CNC for both profile cutting and drilling. In the background you can see Neil there just strengthening those shelves for the washer and dryer. For all the cabinets in this room we used 100mm tall feet, not the axillo ones, we used these chunky ones with the code on screen from Hayfully. They're actually a lot easier to turn by hand when you can reach them than the axillo feet and I think they're a little bit cheaper. But they're also very robust so if you're having to scoot a heavy unit across tiles or floorboards where feet might catch on something, they're not too prone to snapping. For that wide cupboard over on the left there housing the appliances, we used the Sugatsune J95 hinges. These are extra heavy duty hinges. There's more information on these and other specialist hardware on the membership site. Do look for links in the YouTube description below. Neil, our fitter, often does his scribes on site with a handsaw, but for this project with a quantity of scribes to be done, he did also bring to sight a table saw, his Festool one, I think this is a discontinued model now, and he found that was quite efficient for scribing with a, a slight back cut on site. The final challenge for us to get this project over the line was the cutting and fitting of the Jurat solid surface material. We were, however, using the material outside of its recommended use. You shouldn't really have such a thin open frame there so we knew we had to strengthen it and we did so by sticking some 25mm MDF onto it which we shaped on the CNC after sticking to the back of the Jurat to, to then get that supporting structure there around the opening and then we through cut the Jurat again on the CNC and built up the edge using strips as you can see here with adhesive in between. I know that an edge could be done in a better way, I'm sure solid surface specialists will tell me this, but we ran this past the customer because we felt it was deliverable with our level of experience and the test piece was acceptable to them. This is just showing how hard the adhesive is and how quickly it can go off even while you're working with it. The outer perimeter of the jaw out was trimmed to match a template that we'd taken on site already. The inner edge was put back on the CNC for a perfectly perpendicular cut through those three layers. That was then manually sanded and polished up and it came up beautifully. We put a generous but careful line of silicon around all necessary edges and we were just about done. There was one last little thing which was this storage area under the stairs which was what Tim got out of the space I think. So that was the job all done, a complete transformation. We were, as you've seen, responsible for the fitted furniture, but other contractors were very heavily involved in achieving this level of finish. Plus, of course, Joanne's vision for how she wanted the space to feel, which was really guiding the whole process. It's a project we were very proud to be part of, and I hope you can take some inspiration from it.